Good afternoon, gentle listeners. It's Erin, your librarian storyteller for the day. Welcome back to Legend and Lore, where every week I'll be telling you a handful of myths, oak tales, and fairy tales that come from different cultures from all around the world, from Japan to South Africa, from Greece to Polynesia. This week, I'll be regaling you with some Native American legend and lore, also referred to as American Indian or Indigenous Americans. Now make sure you stick around because at some point I'll be giving you a keyword to enter into your summer reading account. Participate and earn enough keywords, you just might win a fabulous prize. Now with that PSA out of the way, let's get started. For a little bit of background, the indigenous Americans do not possess one singular set of, met of myths as they are not one singular nation of people. They vary very much from region to region, from tribe to tribe, each with their own distinct culture, traditions, society, and stories. While I sadly do not have the time to go into over 500 independent nations worth of tales, I will do my best to make a dent with a series of short but memorable ones from different tribes. Now what one thing to keep in mind is that while they all differ in many different ways, what many do in fact have in common is a sense of spiritual force felt through the natural world that has shaped humanity and the earth itself. The first story I will tell you is the story of the White Buffalo Woman, thus told by the, Brule, the Brule Suo people, a subsection of the Lakota people, which in turn is a section of, is a subculture of the main Suo people. One summer, so long ago that nobody knows how long, Doshi Shuakun, the seven sacred council fires of the Lakota Oyate, the nation, came together and camped. The sun shone all the time, but there was no game and the people were starving. Every day they sent scouts to look for game, but the scouts found nothing. Among the bands assembled were the Itazipcho, Ita the without bows, who had their own camp circle under their chief, standing hollow horn. Early one morning, the chief sent two of his young men to hunt for game. They went on foot because at that time the Suo did not, Su did not yet have horses. They searched everywhere but could find nothing. Seeing a high hill, they decided to climb it in order to look over the whole country. Halfway up, they saw something coming towards them from far off, but the figure was floating instead of walking. From this, they knew that the person was Wakan, holy. At first, they could make out only a small moving speck and had to squint to see that it was a human form. But as it came nearer, they realized that it was a beautiful young woman, more beautiful than any they had ever seen, with two, red, two round red dots of face paint on her cheeks. She wore a wonderful white buckskin outfit, tanned until it shone a long way in the sun. It was embroidered with sacred and marvelous designs of porcupine quill in radiant colors no ordinary woman could have made. The Swakon stranger was Pastan Wee, white buffalo woman. In her hand, she carried a large bundle and a fan of sage leaves. She wore her blue black hair loose except for a strand at the left side, which was tied up with buffalo fur. Her eyes shone dark and sparkling with great power in them. The two young men looked at her open-mouthed. One was overawed, but the other desired her body and stretched his hand out to touch her. This woman was Lila Wakan, very sacred, and could not be treated with disrespect. Lightning instantly struck the brash young man and burned him up so that only a small heap of blackened bones was left. Or some say that he was suddenly covered by a cloud and within it he was eaten up by snakes that left only his skeleton just as a man can be eaten up by lust. To the other scout who had behaved rightly, the white buffalo woman said, good things I am bringing, something holy to your nation, a message I carry for your people from the buffalo nation. Go back to the camp and tell the people to prepare for my arrival. Tell your chief to put up a medicine lodge with 24 poles. Let it be made holy for my coming. This young hunter returned to the camp. He told the chief, he told the people, what the sacred woman had commanded. The chief told the Ayapa, the, cri the crier, 
and the crier went through the camp circle, calling, Someone sacred is coming. A holy woman approaches. Make all things ready for her. So the people put up the big medicine teepee and waited. After four days, they saw the white buffalo woman approaching, carrying her bundle before her. Her wonderful white buckskin dress shone from afar. The chief, standing hollow horn, invited her to enter the medicine lodge. She went in and circled the interior sunwise. The chief addressed her respectfully, saying, Sister, we are glad you have come to instruct us. She told him what she wanted done. In the center of the teepee, they were to put up an Owanga Wakam, a sacred altar made of red earth from the buffalo skull and a three-stick rack for a holy thing she was bringing. They did what she directed, and she traced a design with her finger on the smooth edge of the earth of the altar. She showed them how to do, to do all this, then circled this lodge again sunwise. Halting before the chief, she now opened the bundle. The holy thing it contained was the Chanu, Chanupa, the sacred pipe. She held it out to the people and let them look at it. She was grasping the stem with her right hand and the bowl with her left, and thus the pipe has been ever since. It's been held ever since. Again, the chief spoke, saying, Sister, we are glad. We have had no meat for some time. All we can give you is water. They dipped some wakanga, sweet grass, into a skin bag of water and gave it to her. And to this day, the people dip sweet grass on or an eagle wing in water and sprinkle it on a person to be purified. The white buffalo woman showed the people how to use the pipe. She filled it with chanchasha, red willow bark tobacco. She walked around the lodge four times after the manner of Anpetui, the great sun. This represented the circle without end, the sacred hoop, the road of life. The woman placed a dry buffalo chip on the fire and lit the pipe with it. This was Peta Owihan Kashni, the fire without end, the flame to be passed on from generation to generation. She told them that the smoke rising from the bowl was Tun Kashila's breath, the living breath of the great grandfather mystery. The white buffalo woman showed the people the right way to pray, the right words and the right gestures. She taught them how to sing the pipe filling song and how to lift the pipe up into the sky toward grandfather and down towards grandmother earth to Unsi and then to the four directions of the universe. With this holy pipe, she said, you will walk like a living prayer. With your feet resting upon the earth and the pipe stem reaching into the sky, your body forms a living bridge between the sacred beneath and the sacred above. Wakan Tonka smiles upon us because now we are as one. Earth, sky, all living things, the two-legged, the four-legged, the winged ones, the trees, the grasses. Together with the people, they are all related, one family. The pipe holds them all together. Look at this bowl, said the white buffalo woman. Its stone represents the buffalo, but also the flesh and blood of the red man. The buffalo represents the universe in the four directions because he stands on four legs for the four ages of creation. The bluff buffalo is put in the west by Wakantanka at the making of the world to hold back the waters. Every year he loses one hair, and in every one of the four ages he loses a leg. The sacred hoop will end when all his the hair and legs of the great buffalo are gone, and the water comes back to cover the earth. The wooden stem of this chanupa stands for all that grows on the earth. Twelve feathers hang from where the stem, the backbone, joins the bowl, the skull, are from Wanbli Geleshukka, the spotted eagle, the very sacred bird who is the great spirit's messenger and the wisest of all flying creatures. You are joined in all th to all things in the universe, for they all cry out to Tunkashila. Looked at the bowl, engraved in it are seven circles of various sizes, they stand for the seven sacred ceremonies you will practice with this pipe, and for the Ocheti Shakawin, the seven sacred campfires of our Lakota nation. The white buffalo woman then spoke to the women, telling them that it was the work of their hands and the fruit of their bodies which kept the people alive. You are from the Mother Earth, she told them. What you are doing is as great as what the warriors do. And therefore the sacred pipe is also something that binds men and women together in a circle of love. It is the one holy object in the making of which both men and women have a hand. The men carve the bowl and make the stem.
The women decorate it with, but with the bands of colored porcupine quills. When a man takes a wife, they both hold the pipe at the same time, and red trade cloth is wound around their hands, thus tying them together for life. The white buffalo woman had many things for her Lakota sisters in her sacred wooden bag. Corn, wasna, or hemison, wild turnip. She taught them how to make the hearth fire. She filled a buffalo paunch with the cold water and dropped a red hot stone into it. This way you shall cook the corn and the meat, she told them. The white buffalo women woman also talked to the children, because they have an understanding beyond their years. She told them what their fathers and mothers did, did was for them, that their parents could remember being little once, and that they, the children, would grow up to have little ones of their own. She told them, You are the coming generation. That's why you are the most important and precious ones. Some day you will hold this pipe and smoke it. Some day you will pray with it. She spoke once more to all the people. The pipe is alive. It is a red... It is a red being showing you a red life and a red road, and this is the first ceremony for which you will use the pipe. You will use it to keep the soul of a dead person, because through it you can talk to Wong Kan Tonka and the great mystery spirit. The day a human dies is always a sacred day. The day when a soul is released to the great spirit is another. Four women will become sacred on such a day. They will be the ones to cut the sacred tree, the Kan Wakang, for the sun dance. She told the Lakota that they were the purest among the tribes, and for that reason, Tunkashila had bestowed upon them the holy Chanupa. They had chosen to take care of all of it for all the Indian people on the Turtle Kirk continent. She spoke one last time to Standing Hollow Horn, the chief, saying, Remember, this pipe is very sacred. Respect it, and it will take you to the end of the road. The four ages of creation are in me. I'm the four ages. I will come to see you in every generation cycle. I shall come back to you. The sacred woman then took the leave of the people, saying, Toksha ake wachin yang tin ketso. I shall see you again. The people saw her walking off into the same direction from which she had come, outlined against the red ball of the setting sun. As she went, she stopped and rolled over four times. The first time she turned into a black buffalo, the second into a brown one the third into a red one, and finally the fourth time she rolled over, she turned into a white female buffalo calf. A white buffalo is the most sacred living thing you could ever encounter. The white buffalo woman disappeared over the horizon. Sometime she might come back. As soon as she had vanished, buffalo and great herds appeared, allowing themselves to be killed so that the people might survive. And from that day on, the relations, the buffalo, furnished the people with everything they needed meat for their food, skins for their clothes and teepees, bones for their many tools. And that is the first story I have for you today. The second one is from another tribe altogether called The Sweet and Death of the Life and Death of Sweet Medicine. Sweet Medicine being a legendary figure in Native American mythology and most especially among the northern Cheyenne, Cheyenne uh, tribe. A long time ago, the people had no laws, no rules of behavior. They hardly knew enough to survive, and they did shameful things out of ignorance because they didn't understand how to live. There was one man among them who had a natural sense of what was right. He and his wife were good, hard-working people, a family to be proud of. They knew how to feel ashamed and this feeling kept them from doing wrong. Their only child was a daughter, beautiful and modest, who had reached the age where girls begin to think about husbands and making a family. One night, a man's voice spoke to her in a dream. You are handsome and strong, modest and young. Therefore, Sweet Root will visit you. Dismissing it as just a dream, the girl went cheerfully about her chores the next day. On the following night, however, she heard the voice again. Sweet Root is coming. Woman's medicine, which makes a mother's milk flow. Sweet root is coming as a man comes courting. The girl puzzled over the words when she awoke, but in the end shrugged her shoulders. People can't control their dreams, she thought. And the idea of a visit from a medicine root didn't make much sense. On the third night, the dream reoccurred, and this time it was so real that a figure seemed to be standing beside the buffalo robe she slept on. He was talking to her, telling her, Sweet root is coming. He is very near. Soon he will be with you. On the fourth night, she heard the same voice, 
and saw the same figure. Disturbed, she told her mother about it the next morning. There must be something in it, she said. It's so real, and the voice is so much like a man's voice. No, it's just a dream, said her mother. It doesn't mean anything. But from then on, the girl felt different. Something was stirring, growing within her. The girl felt... And after a few months, her condition became obvious. She was going to have a baby. She told her parents that no man had ever touched her, and they believed her. But others would not be likely to, and the girl hid her condition. When she felt the birth pangs come on, she went out into the prairie far from the camp and built herself a bush, a brush shelter. Doing everything herself, she gave birth to a baby boy. She dried the baby, wrapped him in soft moss, and left him there in the wickiup for in her village a baby without a father would be scorned and treated badly. Praying that someone would find him, she went sadly home to her parents. At about the same time, an old woman was out searching the prairie for wild turnips when she dug up what, with an animal's shoulder blade. She heard crying and followed the sound, coming to the wickiup. She was overjoyed to find the baby, as she had never had one of her own. All around the brush shelter, brush shelter grew the sweet root, which makes a mother's milk flow, so she named the boy Sweet Medicine. She took him home to her shabby teepee, not even though she had nothing to offer him but love. In the teepee next to the old woman's lived, lived a young mother who was nursing a small child, and she agreed to nurse Sweet Medicine also. He grew faster and learned faster than ordinary children, and was weaned in no time. When he was only ten years old, he had already grown up wisdom and hunting skill far in advance of his age. But because he had no family and lived at the edge of the camp in a poor teepee, nobody paid attention to Sweet Medicine's exceptional powers. That year there was a drought, a drought, very little game, and much hunger in the village. Grandmother, Sweet Medicine said to the old woman, find me an old buffalo hide. Any dried out, chewed up scrap with holes in it will do. The woman searched about along the refuse piles and found a wrinkled, brittle piece that the starving dogs had been chewing on. When she brought it to Sweet Medicine, he told her, Take this to the steam outside the camp. Wash it with the flowing water. Make it pliable. Scrape it clean. After she had done this, Sweet Medicine took a willow wand and bent it into a hoop, which he colored with a sacred red earth paint. He cut the buffalo hide into one long strip and wove it back and forth over the hoop, making a kind of net with, with an opening in the center. Then he cut four wild cherry sticks, sharpened them to a point, and hardened them in the hearth fire. The next morning, he said, Grandmother, come with me. We're going to play the hoop and stick game. He took the hoop and the cherry wood sticks and walked into the middle of the camp circle. Grandmother, roll this hoop for me, he said. She rolled the hoop along the ground, and Sweet Medicine hurled his pointed sticks through the center of it, hitting the right spot every time. Soon a lot of people, men and women, boys and girls, came to watch the strange new game. Then Sweet Medicine cried, Grandmother, let me hit it once more and make the hoop into a fat buffalo calf. Again, he threw a stick like a dart. Again, the stick went through the center of the hoop, and as it did so, the hoop turned into a fat yellow buffalo calf. The stick had pierced its heart, and the calf fell down dead. Now you people will have plenty to eat, said Sweet Medicine. Come and butcher the calf. The people gathered and roasted chunks of tender calf meat over their fires. And no matter how many pieces of flesh they cut from the calf's body, it was never picked clean. However much they ate, there was always more. So the people had their fill, and that was the end of the famine. It was also the first hoop and stick game played among the Cheyenne. The sacred game has had much power attached to it, and it is still being played. A boy's first kill is an important happening in his life, something he will always remember. After killing his first buffalo, a boy will be honored by his father, who may hold a feast for him and give him a man's name. There would be no feast for sweet medicine all the same. Medicine all the same. He was very happy when he killed the fat yellow buffalo calf on his first hunt. He was skinning and butchering it when he was approached by an elderly man, a chief too old to do much hunting, but still harsh and commanding. This is just the kind of hide I have been looking for, said the chief. I will take it. You can't have a boy's first hide, said Sweet Medicine. Surely you must know this, but you are welcome to have the meat because I honor old age. The chief took the meat, but grabbed the hide too and began to walk off with it. Sweet Medicine took hold of one end and they started a tug of war. The chief used his riding whip on Sweet Medicine, shouting, How dare a poor nothing boy defy a chief! As he whipped Sweet Medicine again and again across the face, 
the boy's fighting spirit was aroused. He grabbed a big buffalo leg bone and hit the old man over the head. Some say sweet medicine killed the chief. Others say the old man just fell down stunned. But in the village, the people were angry that a mere boy had dared to fight the old chief. Some said, let's whip him. Others said, let's kill him. After he had returned to the old woman's lodge, sweet medicine sensed what was going on. He said, grandmother, some young men of the warrior societies will come here to kill me for having stood up for myself. He thanked her for her kindness to him and then fled from the village. Later, when the young warriors came, they were so angry to find the boy gone that they pulled the lodge down and set fire to it. The following morning, someone saw Sweet Medicine dressed like a fox warrior, standing on a hill overlooking the village. His enemies set out in pursuit, but he was always just out of their reach, and they finally retired exhausted. The next morning, he appeared as an elk warrior, carrying a crooked screw coop stick wrapped in otter skin. Again, they tried to catch and kill him, and again he evaded them. They resumed their futile chase on the third morning, where he wore the red face paint and red feathers of a red shield warrior, and on the fourth, when he dressed like a dog soldier and shook a small red rattle tied with buffalo hair at his pursuers. On the fifth day, he appeared in the full regalia of a Cheyenne chief. That made the village warriors angrier than before, but they still couldn't catch him, and after that, they saw him no more. Wandering alone over the prairie, the boy heard a voice calling, leading him to a beautiful dark forested land of many hills. Standing apart from the others was a single mountain shaped like a huge teepee, the sacred medicine mountain called Bear Butte. Butte. Sweet medicine found a secret opening which had, been, has, had, which has since closed today, or perhaps was visible to him alone, and entered the mountain. It was hollow inside like a teepee, from forming a sacred lodge filling, filled with people who looked like ordinary men and women, but were really powerful spirits. Grandson, come in. We have been expecting you the holy people said, and when Sweet Medicine took his seat, they began teaching him the Cheyenne way to live so that he could return to the people and give them this knowledge. First of all, the spirits gave him the sacred four arrows, saying, This is the great gift we are handing you. With these wonderful arrows, the tribe will prosper. Two arrows are for war and two for hunting, but there is much, much more to the four arrows. They have great powers. They contain rules which, by which men ought to live. The spirit people taught Sweet Medicine how to pray to the arrows, how to keep them, how to renew them. They taught him the wise laws of the 44 chiefs. They taught him how to set up the rules for the warrior societies. They taught him how women should be honored. They taught him the many useful things by which people could live, survive, and prosper, things people had not yet learned at this time. Finally, they taught him how to make a special teepee in which the sacred arrows were to be kept. Sweet Medicine listened respectfully and learned well, and finally an old spirit man burned incense of sweet grass to purify both sweet medicine and the sacred arrow bundle. Then the Cheyenne boy put the holy bundle on his back and began the long journey home to his people. During his absence there had been a famine in the land. The buffalo had gone into hiding, for they were angry that the people did not know how to live and were behaving badly. When sweet medicine arrived at the village, he found a group of tired and listless children, their ribs sticking out were playing with little buffalo figures they had made out of mud. Sweet Medicine immediately charged, changed the figures into large chunks of juicy buffalo meat and fat. Now there's enough for you to eat, he told the young ones, with plenty left over for your parents and grandparents. Take the meat, fat, and tongues into the village and tell two good young hunters to come out in the morning to meet me. Though the children carried the message and two young hunters went out and looked everywhere for Sweet Medicine the next day, all they saw was a big eagle circling above them. They tried again on the second and third day, but with no success. But on the fourth morning, they found Sweet Medicine standing on top of a hill, overlooking the village. He told the two, I am come bringing a wonderful gift from the Creator, which the spirits inside the great medicine mountain have sent you. Tell the people to set up a big lodge in the center of camp. Cover its floor with sage and purify it with burning sweet grass. Tell everyone to go inside the teepee and stay there. No one was to see me approaching. When at last all was ready, Sweet Medicine walked slowly towards the village and four times called out, People of Cheyenne, with a great power I am approaching. Be joyful, the sacred arrows I am bringing. He entered the teepee with the sacred arrow bundle and said, You have not yet learned how to live the right way. That is why the ones above are angry and the buffalo went into hiding. The two young hunters lit the fire, and Sweet Medicine filled the deer bone pipe and sacred, sacred tobacco. 
All night through he taught the people what the spirits inside the holy mountain had taught him. These teachings established the way of the Tisdistias, the true Cheyenne nation. Toward morning, sweet medicine sang four sacred songs, and after each song he smoked the pipe, and its holy breath ascended through the smoke hole, up into the day sky, to the, up to the great mystery. At daybreak, as the sun rose and the people emerged from the sacred arrow lodge, they found the prairie about, around them covered with buffalo. The spirits were no longer angry. The famine was over. For many nights to come, sweet medicine instructed the people in the sacred laws. He lived among the Cheyenne for a long time and made them into a proud tribe respected throughout the plains. Four lives the creator had given him, but even sweet medicine was not immortal. Only the rocks and mountains are forever. When he grew up old and feeble, feeble and felt that the end of his appointed time was near, he directed the people to carry him to a place near the sacred bear Brute. There they made a sacred hut, a small hut for him out of cottonwood branches and cedar lodge poles covering with bark and leaves. They spread its floor with sage, flat cedar leaves, and fragrant grass. It was a good lodge to die in, and when they placed him before it, he addressed the people for the last time. I have seen in my mind that some time after I am dead, and may the time be long, light-skinned bearded men will arrive with sticks spitting fire. They will conquer the land and drive you before them. They will kill the animals who gave their flesh that you might live, and they will bring strange animals for you to ride and eat. They will introduce war and evil, strange sickness and death. They will try to make you fight, forget Mah Maheo, the creator, and the things I taught you and will impose their own alien evil ways. They will take your land little by little until there is nothing left for you. I do not like to tell you this, but you must know. You must be strong when the bad times come. You men, and particularly you women, because much depends on you, because you are the perpetuators perpetu perpetu of life, and if you weaken, the Cheyenne will, will cease to be. Now I have said all there is to say. Then Sweet Medicine went into his hut to die. Sounds familiar, right? Very similar to our first story. While the stories themselves differ, differ and the lessons do as well, they a lot of them have similar themes to each other. My next story, uh, before we get to our next story, as promised, I do have the keyword of the day. The keyword of the day is buffalo. Ca all capitals, B-U-F-F-A-L-O, buffalo, for the animal that is very much considered sacred among indigenous Americans. Now, I have two more stories to tell you, much shorter than our first two, but I think equally important. Among the Native Americans, there are also great, besides tales of great wisdom and learning, there are also tales of tricksters. One in particular is, is named Coyote. Coyote is viewed sometimes with recklessness, with contempt, or with wisdom. He is a very changeable figure depending on what tribe is telling the story and what story is being told. He can be crude, he can be clever, He's def but he's definitely always a character. I will be telling you two stories, one where Coyote shows his wisdom and one when, well, you'll see. But the first one, Coyote Kills the Giant. This, this story is told by the, by the tribes of the Flathead, Flathead Indian Res Reservation in Western Montana. Coyote was walking one day when he met Old Woman. She greeted him and asked where he was headed. Just roaming around, said Coyote. You better stop going that way or you'll meet a giant who kills everybody. Oh, giants don't frighten me, said Coyote, who had never met one. I always kill them. I'll fight this one too and make an end of him. He's bigger and closer than you think, said Old Woman. I don't care, said Coyote, deciding that a giant would be about as big as a bold moose and calculating that he could kill one easily. So Coyote said goodbye to Old Woman and went ahead, whistling a tune. On his way, he saw a large fallen branch that looked like a club. Picking it up, he said to himself, I'll hit the giant over the head with this. It's big enough and heavy enough to kill him. He walked on and came to a huge cave right in the middle of the path. Whistling merrily, he went in. Suddenly, Coyote met a woman who was crawling along on the ground. What's the matter, he said. 
I'm starving, she said, and too weak to walk. What are you doing with that stick? I'm going to kill the giant with it, said Coyote, and he asked if she knew where he was hiding. Feeble as she was, the woman laughed. <laughs> You're already in the giant's belly. How can I be in its belly? asked Coyote. I haven't even met him. You probably thought it was a cave when you walked into his mouth, so the woman said and sighed. It's easy to walk in, but nobody ever walks out. This giant is so big you can't take him in with your own eye, with your eyes. His belly fills a whole valley. Coyote threw his stick away and kept on walking. What else could he do? Soon he came across more people lying around half dead. Are you sick? he asked. No, they said, just starving to death. We're trapped inside the giant. You're foolish, said Coyote. If we're really inside this giant, then the cave walls must be the inside of his stomach. We can just cut some meat and fat from that. We, we never thought of that, they said. You're not as smart as I am, said Coyote. Coyote took his hunting knife and started cutting chunks out of the cave walls. As he had guessed, they were indeed the giant's fat and meat, and he used it to feed the starving people. He even went back and gave some meat to the woman he had first met. Then all the people imprisoned in the giant's belly started to feel stronger and happier, but not completely happy. You fed us, they said, and thank you, but how are we going to get out of here? Don't worry, said Coyote. I'll kill the giant by stabbing him in the heart. Where is his heart? It must be around here someplace. Look at the volcano puffing and beating over there, someone said. Maybe it's the heart. So it is, friend, said the coyote, and began to cut at the mountain. The giant spoke up. Is that you, coyote? I've heard of you. Stop this stabbing and cutting and leave me alone. You can leave through my mouth. I'll open it for you. I'll leave, but not quite yet, said coyote, hacking at the heart. He told the others to get ready. As soon as I have him in his death throes, there will be an earthquake. He'll open his jaw to take out a last breath, and then his mouth will close forever. So be ready to run out fast. Coyote cut a deep hole in the giant's heart, and lava started to flow out. It was the giant's blood. The giant groaned, and the ground around the people's feet trembled. Quick now, shouted Coyote. The giant's mouth opened, and they all ran out. The last one was the wood tick. The giant's teeth were closing on him, but Coyote managed to pull him through at the last moment. Look at me, cried the wood tick. I'm all flat. It happened when I pulled you through, said Coyote. You'll always be flat from now on, but be glad you're alive. I guess I'll get used to it, said the wood tick, and he did. Like I said, cunning, a little foolish, but clever more than he, more clever than he lets on. Most of the time. This story, it's cruder than the others, and let's just say Coyote does not learn much in the way of lessons. This story also features Itome, who is, a, who is also another trickster a uh, character from indigenous American mythology no, uh, in, represented by a spider or a man-like spider. This, is a sto this story also comes from the Sioux people, but from the White River tribe. It is called, What's This? My Balls for Your Dinner? Iktomi, the Wicked Spider-Man, and Shunk Manitou, Coyote, are two no-good loafers. They lie, they steal, they are greedy, they are always, always after women. Maybe because they are so very alike, they are friends, except when they try to trick each other. One day, Iktomi invited Coyote for dinner at his lodge. Iktomi took, told his wife, Old woman, here are two fine big buffalo livers for my friend Coyote and myself. Fry them up nicely, the way I like them, and get some timsela, some wild turnips on the side, and afterwards serve us some wojapi, some berry soup. Use ch choke cherries for that. Coyote always likes something sweet after his meal. Is that all? asked Ikitomi's wife. I guess so. I can't think of anything else. There's no fair liver for me? his wife inquired. You can have what's left after my co friend Coyote and I have eaten, said Ikitomi. Well, I'll go out for a while. Maybe I can shoot a fine plump duck, too. Coyote always stuffs himself, so one liver might not be enough for him. But watch this good friend of mine. Don't let him stick his hands under your robe. He likes to do that. Well, I go now. Have everything ready for us. Coyote never likes to wait. Iktome left, and his old woman got busy cooking. I know who's always stuffing her himself, she thought. I know whose hands are always busy feeling up, so up feeling under some girl's robe. I know who can't wait. It's that no good husband of mine. The fried liver smelled so wonderful that the wife said to herself, Those greedy, stingy, overbearing men. I know them. They'll feast on these fine livers, and a few turnips will be all that they leave for me. They have no consideration for a poor woman. 
Oh, that liver there looks so good, smells so good. I know it tastes good. Maybe I'll try a little piece, just a tiny one. They won't notice. So the wife tasted a bit of the liver and then another bit and then another and then in no time that liver was gone. I might as well eat the other one too, the wife said to herself, and she did. But then, what will I do now, she thought. When Iktome finds out, he'll surely beat me. But it was worth it. Just then, Coyote arrived. He had dressed himself up in a fine, beaded outfit with fringe sleeves. Where is my good friend Iktome? he said, asked. What's he up to? Probably nothing good. How are you, friend? said the woman. My husband Iktome is out, mm -hmm. taking care of some business. He'll be back soon. Sit down. Be comfortable. On some business, you don't say, remarked Coyote quickly sticking his hand under the woman's robes and between her legs. Iktomi told me you tried to do that. He told me not to let you. Oh, Iktomi and I are such good friends, said Coyote. We share everything. He joked. He, chuck, he chucked the woman under the chin. He tickled her under the arms. And pretty soon he was all the way in her, way, way up inside her. It feels good, said the woman, but be quick about it. Iktomi could be back at any time now. You think he'd mind, seeing as we are such good friends? I'm sure he would. You better stop now. Well, all right. It smells very good here, but I see no meat cooking, just some timsela. Meat is what I like, and meat is what you'll get. One sees this is the first one sees this is the first time you've come here for dinner. Otherwise you'd know what you'll get. We always serve the guests the same thing. Everybody likes it. Is it really good? It's more than good. It's Lila Washte. Very good. Coyote smacked his lips, his mouth watering. I can't wait. What is it? Tell me. Why your ikta? Why your ikka? Your susu? Your eggs? Your balls? Your big hairy balls? We always have the balls of our guests for dinner. Oh my, this must be a joke. A very bad joke. It's no joke at all. And I'd better cut them off right now with my big skinning knife, because it's getting late. Iktome gets mad when I don't have his food ready. He'll beat me. And there I was, fooling around with you instead of doing my cooking. I'll do it right now. Drop your beat. Drop your breech cloth. You won't feel a thing. I do this so fast, I have practice. The woman came after Coyote with a knife in her hand. Wait a bit, said Coyote. Before you do this, let me go out and make some water. I'll be right back. And saying this, he ran out of the lodge. But he didn't come back. He ran and ran as fast as his feet would carry him. Just then, Iktome came back without any ducks. He had caught nothing. He saw Coyote running away and asked, Old woman, what's the matter with that crazy friend of mine? Why is he running off like that? Your good friend is very greedy. He doesn't have the sharing spirit, his wife told Iktome. Never invite him again. He has no manners. He doesn't know how to behave. He saw those two fine buffalo livers, which I cooked just as you like them, and didn't want to share them with you. He grabbed both and made off with them. Some friend. Iktome rushed out of the lodge in a frenzy, running after Coyote as fast as he could, shouting, Coyote! Gola! Friend, leave me at least one. Leave one for me, for your old friend Iktomi. Coyote did not stop. He ran even faster than Iktomi. Running and running, he looked back over his sh shoulder and shouted, Cousin, if you catch me, you can have both of them. <laughs> like I said, a very versatile character and very versatile stories. This is just, two, these are just four of many hundreds of stories that can be found. And legends are being born all the time. I would seriously recommend checking out all the many different tribes and all the different stories that they, that they possess. You will never run out of, of tales being told. That's all I have for you today, gentle listeners. Tune in next time for the next installment into our series where I tell you a few more stories from different cultures around the world. I look forward to seeing you. Please be well and have a wonderful day. Goodbye.